Okay, so I've, I've been thinking the last week, right, that we are obsessed with being in the right. We're absolutely obsessed with being in the right, yeah? Think about last time you had a disagreement with someone at work. Now, I know you ain't got to think too hard, right? Okay. And instinctively, whether it's with your boss or someone else at work, instinctively you feel like, I'm in the right. They're in the wrong. For those of you who are car drivers, you identify with this because when someone honks at you, what is your first reaction? Maybe you shouldn't say <laughs> But instinctively, you want to just honk back, isn't it? Honk, I'm in the right. And when you honk other people, even if, if they've done the most dangerous bit of driving that almost killed you and your family, they will immediately either honk back or give you the finger because they're like, I'm in the right. And when we have family problems, we automatically assume, I'm in the right. And when we have problems with the council, we always assume, I'm in the right. And we, see it, we do it on Facebook, isn't it? We, we put about our problems on Facebook so that other people can show us, yes, you are in the right. We all have a desire to be in the right and not be in the wrong. And we naturally think a lot of the time that we are in the right. But what about in front of God? If it was just you standing in a courtroom and God was there as the judge, would you be in the right? Because the Bible says that at the end, at the end, it will be like a big court case, the biggest court case ever. And every human being will be judged by God. And that will be a time when you'll want to know for sure whether you really are in the right. You don't want it to be like, I don't know if any of you guys remember this. You know when you're young and you're trying to get into a nightclub that you're not old enough to get into? Maybe the nightclub is an over-21s only nightclub, and you're 18, and because you're 18, you're thinking, yeah, I'm pretty big, I'll get in this club. But when you get to the queue, and you're queuing up, waiting to get to security, you have that kind of scared feeling. You're like, am I really going to get in? And you're like, what's going to happen if they ask me for my ID? Are they going to accept my ID? Is, it, is my ID good enough? You know, and you have that horrible feeling about, am I going to be in the right when I stand in front of security? Well, today we're going to be looking at being in the right before God, which is the most important thing. Because in some ways, in some ways, but you can't push it too far, but in some ways, at the end, going into heaven, which is the new heavens and new earth that God's going to make, going into heaven in some ways is like, Go into that club, that exclusive club, and there's security on the door who say, show us your ID. And we got to make sure we got the right ID, because you only get in with the right ID. And we're going to be looking at, in the book of Romans, what this ID is. But first, let me pray. Lord God, please help me to teach this passage of scripture. It's kind of worded in a complicated way, but... I know that they're your words, God, so they're powerful. So I pray that you'd help me to teach them properly. And I pray that you would pour your Holy Spirit upon us and help us to understand these words, Lord God. And I pray that you would change our hearts and our minds as we look at these words. Amen. Amen. So today we're looking at the book of Romans. And interestingly, when the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Romans, he wrote them to a bunch of people who... A lot of them thought they were in the right with God. And the reason why they thought they were in the right with God was because they'd done lots of good things. Yeah? Now, we identify with that, right? It's easy, like we got here today, the church, it's easy to feel like, yes, got to get a few points. Made it to church. Other people are in bed. Maybe some people are hung over, but we're in church. We can feel kind of good with ourselves, like, yeah, maybe I'm in the right with God right now. Maybe you help someone in the week, and you're thinking, yeah, I helped that person. Ah, oh, yeah, God must be well happy with me now. And we can quite easily feel like we're in the right with God because of things we've done. And this is how a lot of the Jews felt in, in the Apostle Paul's day, 2,000 years ago. And who was the big figure that the Jews looked to? Abraham. Abraham, thank you. So 
So let's see, what Paul does is he, he gives them an example from Abraham. So Romans chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, tell me, is it, is it big enough for you to see on the screen? Okay, if it's not, open your Bible. I'm using the NIV. Romans 4, verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? So Paul starts off saying, okay, let's see what Abraham says. What was Abraham's experience? How did Abraham get right with God? And then he says, verse 2, if in fact Abraham was, and what word does it say there? Justified. Justified. Okay, justified. Now, check it out. This is well confusing. Yeah, I'm sorry. I've got to put you through this now, but... The word justified in the Bible don't quite mean the same as what it means when we say it in English, okay? So the word justified in the Bible means to declare someone righteous or to declare someone in the right. So when he says, if Abraham was justified, it means if Abraham was declared in the right. In other words, if God said, yes, Abraham, you are in the right according to my standards. So it says, if in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about. Now when it says works here, it's not chatting about going to work, but it's chatting about doing stuff. Doing stuff. So give me some examples. What are, what are things that we can do that some people might think would make us in the right before God? Helping one another, that's a good one. So that would be a work, helping one another. He's saying here, Abraham wasn't in the right because he helped anyone. Someone give me another example. Giving to charity, Giving to charity. yeah. Yeah, especially now with the terrible things that are happening in the world. So that would be a work. And by the way, these are good things to do. I'm not saying they're not. But it's saying here that Abraham is saying, was he in the right because he gave to charity? The answer is no, because it says here, but not before God. In other words, no, Abraham didn't have any reason to boast. He didn't have any reason to say, well, I've done this and I've done that. No, before God, he couldn't do that. He wasn't in the right because of things he'd done. Verse 3, it says, what does the scripture say? And now he's going to quote a bit of the Old Testament from Genesis 15. It says, Abraham, what did he do? believed. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, what this means is that Abraham didn't do anything good that made him in the right. The thing that made him in the right was believing God. God made a promise to Abraham. He said, I'm going to give you many descendants. And Abraham was past it. He was a very old man. But Abraham believed God. He trusted God. He trusted God's promise. He said, yes, I believe God and what he says. And it says here, because of that, it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, when you go back and look at the Hebrew, because the, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and when you look at the Hebrew, you can see in the not just with the words, but with the construction of the sentence, that what it means is that God regarded Abraham as righteous, but when he looked at Abraham and thought, yeah, I see Abraham as with righteousness, it wasn't Abraham's righteousness that he had. In other words, Abraham had someone else's righteousness. God regarded Abraham as righteous, but is with someone else's righteousness. Now, I realize this is complicated. I need my wife. Where's my uh, <coughs> prop? In the bag. In this bag? Okay, so for some of you were here last week, yes? Yeah, so you know this, but those of you who weren't here last week, I'm going to do this again to make the point. It was this, if you come today for the first time, this is one of the most complicated passages we ever teach at church. Last week, it was real simple. Jesus told a parable, right, of a wedding feast. It's the idea of at the end, yeah, the big party with Jesus, when Jesus comes back. There's a wedding feast, 
But to be in the wedding feast, you had to be wearing what? What? You had to be wearing the proper wedding garments, right? And what we had there was a picture of being made right with God, where God takes off your dirty Adidas tracksuit, right? And then what he does is he clothes you, he clothes you with a robe. And whose robe is it? Jesus' robe. So that then when you stand before God at the end, you're in Jesus' robe. And God looks at you and he's like, you look righteous. He's like, thank you very much. It's not mine, it's Jesus's. You know, and that, and that is the way it works, okay? Today, we're looking at a more technical, complicated way of explaining it. But I'm hoping it will still bless us as we look at it from another perspective. So, Abraham, right? He believed God. And then God looked at him. He regarded Abraham as being righteous, as having righteousness. But it weren't his righteousness. It was someone else's. Uh, let's explain it this way, right? You're 18 years old. And you want to go to a nightclub that's only for over 21s. So what you do, right, is you get one of your friends who's older and you say, can I borrow your ID? Yeah? Yeah, you know this. It's you super spiritual people are like, no, no. <laughs> right? So you, you, <laughs> you borrow your friend's ID because they are 22 years old. So you've got your ID that says 22, but really you're 18. Now... You turn up, and you're there waiting for security. And then security say, how old are you? You go, I'm 22. <laughs> and they say, let's see your ID. You know? And so you show them your ID, your friend's ID, and it says you're how old? 22. The security looks at it. He looks at you. And he says, okay. Because he is regarding you as 22 years old. He looks at you, and he I regard you as 22 years old. Come in. Now, you're not really 22 years old, but you're regarded as 22 years old because of the ID card you've got. Same way with Abraham. Abraham wasn't really righteous. I mean, you remember the big story where he lies about his wife? Yeah? Now, not only does he lie to his wife, there's a time, right, in the Old Testament where they go to Egypt and Abraham says to his wife, he says, Mrs., you're so beautiful, I think, yeah, that the Egyptians will kill me so they can marry you. Here's the plan. I'll pretend you're my sister, yeah? <laughs> and so he pretends she's his sister with the result that she will end up being in Pharaoh's court as one of Pharaoh's concubines. But Abraham's like, boy, I've got to take care of number one. Yeah? No one else will. <laughs> Trying to protect himself. So he, he lies. He doesn't trust God. He doesn't protect his wife. He puts his wife in harm's way. He wasn't a righteous guy. He'd done loads of other good things, but boy, that's pretty bad. I mean, your wife would not be happy with you, I don't think, if if you did something like that in this day and age, you know? Imagine walking down the street with your wife, and then suddenly there's like a gang there that looked kind of intimidating, and you're like, Mrs., let's pretend we're not married, okay? You walk over there, and I'll walk over here. And that's not cool, but... Abraham's kind of like that. So he's not righteous. But God regards Abraham as being righteous because Abraham believes. And what happens, what we know with the benefit of hindsight, is that Abraham, in a way, gets given Jesus' ID. Jesus' ID card says 100% righteous, 100% in the right, because Jesus lived a perfect life. He always obeyed God the Father and he died, and then he rose again. And his ID card says 100% righteous. So Abraham gets Jesus' ID card. And so he is regarded by God as having Jesus' righteousness. So, it says in verse 4, Now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. This is true, isn't it? When you work and you get your money, you don't say, oh, that's a nice gift from my boss. Instead, you say, that's too right. If you used to work where I used to work, you was always checking it each month because it's normally underpaid by a little bit. Now, here's the thing, right? What Paul is trying to explain here is that righteousness is not something you earn. You don't work and do good deeds and then get given righteousness. 
Instead, it's a gift. Christ's ID card is a gift that you get given. You don't ever have to earn it, which is good because we could never earn it. Because imagine this, right? Imagine there's someone in Roehampton who you owe £100 to. Okay, you owed them £100, right? So let's write this here. This is minus 100. This is what you owe them, okay? And here is a zero. And here is 100. And let me write 200. Now you owe this person minus 100, which means you're here. And sorry, the zero should be there, shouldn't it? Yeah. Right, now, this person who you owe 100 pounds, you then say, can I rent a flat off you? And you rent a flat off them for 100 pound a month, okay? And you only earn 100 pound a month. So that means in January, you already owe them 100, right? You give them 100 pound for the flat that costs 100 pound, okay? How much money do you owe them? So you've paid them 100, right? You've paid them 100 now. But what should you have paid them? Should have paid them 200 because you still owed them 100. As you can see now, I've done this chart all wrong. That should be 100 there, sorry. Okay, now the next month, you're like, well, next month, I will make it up to them. Next month, you earn 100 pound, you pay them 100 pound. So what do you owe them now? What do you owe them? You owe them 100 pound, right? Because you've now paid them 100 pound, what you're supposed to pay them, but you still owe them this 100 pound. So you're still in the red by 100 pound. And that will go on for the rest of your life. Okay? Now, here's the thing. Th in some ways, this is what we're like with God, right? Because we're born sinners, so we're already in debt to God, and then we sin, right? We sin as children, and we sin as adults, and it, we sin, so we're in debt. Now, if at some stage in your life you turn to Christ and you say, Jesus, save me, I now want to be a Christian, okay? If from that point on you live each month of your life perfectly, you do everything right and don't do anything wrong, you're still in debt. You see that? You've still got this debt here because you was in debt before. And even if you say, but you know what? I'll go to church. God will be like, well, you should go to church anyway. That's what you're supposed to do. If you say, yeah, but I help other people. God will say, well, you should help other people anyway. That's what you're supposed to do. You don't get extra credit for that. And God could always say, and look at all the debt that you owe me. You are helplessly in debt. You can never get out of debt with God. Never get out of debt. What you can get is a gift from God. You can get a gift where it's like the landlord says, you know what, this 100 you owe here, I'll write it off. I'm going to credit to your account 100. And now it's written off, which then means this is written off, and so on. It's a gift. It's not something you work for. And so when we go back to Abraham here in verse 3, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. That's like God saying, Abraham, you're in debt with the righteousness, but I'm going to credit it to your account so that it looks like you are fully righteous. Or another way of looking at it, I'm going to give you Jesus' ID card. You can now get into the big club at the end because you've got Jesus' ID card. So let's read on. Um, verse 5. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. So here it's saying we can't work to be right with God. We can't work to be in the right. What we can do, though, is we can trust God. And what kind of God is he there? Has he described? He's a God who justifies the wicked. That's deep. Wicked people, God is in the habit of saying to wicked people, I'm going to make you in the right. Doesn't seem fair, but we know that the way God's made it so that it's fair 
is because God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and to pay for the sins of wicked people. So that God could say, those wicked people, they needed a punishment. And what I've done is I've poured their punishment on Jesus instead. Not only that, but I've had Jesus live a righteous life in their place so that those wicked people can be clothed in the robe, so that they can have an ID that says 100% righteous. This is what God does to wicked people. Now, this is good news for me, because I'm a wicked person. And if any of you are wicked people, this is good news for you as well. Because this means, wow, it's not about trying harder to be a better person. Instead, it's about believing in Jesus Christ. Now, maybe some of you guys are like me, where you have moments during the day when you're aware of how wicked you are. Like, for me, it's funny, it keeps moving around, but it's always late at night. It used to be late at night when I was walking to the loo. You know, every time I walked along the corridor, I'd be like, man, I am such a wicked person. Why does God let me live? It's funny, a friend of mine, actually, Andy Mason, said when he heard me say that, he said, we need to do some deliverance in your hallway. (laughs) But now it's moved. Now I normally find, it's when my head's on the pillow, I'm trying to get to sleep, And as I'm getting to sleep, I'm thinking, I am such a bad person. How can I ever be right with God? I'm a bad person. Maybe you have other times during the day or there's certain situations where you think, I'm a bad person. What can I do? What I find wonderful about this is this tells me you might be a wicked person, but God justifies the wicked. God is in the business of justifying the wicked. God is the guy who says, psst, do you want an ID? And he gives you an ID that says you're righteous. But check it out. God isn't being deceptive. It's not like with the security guard at the club. It's not like Jesus is tricking God the Father or God the Father is tricking Jesus. This was a plan they both come up with at the beginning. The Father, God the Father says to God the Son, he says, listen, we got to make these wicked people righteous. And so he says, Jesus, I'll send you to live a perfect life in their place. And Jesus says, yeah, I'll do that. And the father says, and Jesus, you'll die in the place of wicked people. And Jesus says, yeah, I'll do that. And the father says, and we raise you up again by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then all the wicked people can live with you for all eternity. And Jesus is like, yeah, I'll do that. And the Holy Spirit's like, yeah, sounds like a plan. I'm obviously paraphrasing you. I don't know word for word how the conversation went, but this is the general idea. And so the Trinity, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and God the Holy Spirit work together to save wicked people to give an ID. Which means at the end, anyone who trusts in God, at the end, when you're there and there's the angels and you're wondering, am I going to get into the new heavens and new earth? And security's there, checking people's righteousness, you know, with a sense of, you know, and you're thinking, no, is it going to beep? And then God's there and he's like, what's his righteousness like? And you go, ah. I've got Christ's ID, 100% righteousness. And God says, yeah, I regard you as righteous. Just like the security guard who regards the person as 22 when he's really 18. He says, I regard you as righteousness. But you haven't conned God. God knows he's planned it from the beginning. And Jesus is there like, yeah, that's my righteousness. We gave it to him. That's, That's how it works. So... God justifies wicked people. And to to people who are wicked, if they've got faith, their faith is credited as righteousness. They are in the right in God's eyes. Now, so Paul chatted about Abraham, right? Because the Jews were big into Abraham and some of them thought that Abraham... You read some of the texts that some Jews wrote and they thought, some of them, that Abraham had lived a perfect life. So Paul's correcting that and saying, no, that's not how it works. And now Paul turns to another character, David. Now, would you, when I say King David, what's the first thing you think of? Bathsheba. Bathsheba, right? Okay. So Bathsheba was the lady that David saw one time when she was having a bath. And then he was like, hmm, I like her. Invited her around, had sex with her, had got her pregnant, and then was like, oh, no, I got her pregnant. I'm in trouble. And then what did he do? Whose name was? It's on the tip of your tongue, isn't it? Who's who's got it? Uriah. Uriah. Who was a good soldier. He was hench. He was loyal. And, And David at first is like, I've got to con him. What I'll do, I'll bring him back from the battlefields, right? 
I'll bring him back. I'll wine and dine him. So he gets, gets him all like drinking. And then he says, now go to your missus. Because he's thinking, he'll sleep with his missus. Then when she shows, then everyone will be like, ah, oh, Uriah, he had that little holiday from the battlefields. He got drunk, slept with her, and boom. And so, uh, but what does Uriah say? He's like, no, Lord, I won't go back to my missus when all the men are fighting. So he doesn't, yeah? He sleeps on the floor, right? So David's like, ah, oh, what am I going to do? So he's scheming, and he comes up with a plan. Puts him in front of the battle. He gets him at the front of the battle line, isn't it? And you, you've seen them old movies, yeah? You see them charging, and you're thinking, I tell you this what, I'm, I'm thinking, I don't know if I want to be at the front, you know? <laughs> I wouldn't mind being the leader of the army, but I'd want to be at the back. But you always see the leader at the front, and you're thinking, how does he never die? Surely at the front, straight away, whoosh, that's it. So Uriah gets sent to the front, and Uriah gets killed. So Adam has now taken out Bathsheba's husband. Uh, who did I say? Adam. <laughs> it all comes back to Adam at some point. <laughs> so, so, yeah, thank you. So David. So David's a bad guy, right? Murder. Lying, adultery, yeah, bad, bad guy, right, David. And David writes a song. Psalm 51. He does, Psalm 51. And there's another psalm he writes. Anyone know what it is? It's quoted here. Psalm 32. Psalm 32. And so Paul now tells us about David. He says, verse 6, David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. So David writes a song about people like himself who God credits them with righteousness without all the good works that they should have done to get that righteousness. And this is it, verse 7. Blessed are those whose, and what word does it say? Transgressions. Yeah, transgressions, right, are when you step over the line. Yeah, where there's a line that says, don't do this, and you say, I'm going to step over it. That's what a transgression is, which is what David done. Yeah, David knew from the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. But he stepped over that line and said, I'm going to do it. David says here, blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. So David is talking about being in the right with God because your sins get forgiven. They actually get covered. Remember, we done like with the robe. You actually get clothed with this robe so that your sins are covered. God don't see your sins. And that's how David felt. David knew he was a sinner, but he knew that God forgave him of his sins. And so he knew he was in the right because God forgave him. And we know with hindsight, the reason why God could forgive him is because Jesus paid the price for David on the cross. He paid for the sins of his people. And then it says in verse 8, Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will, what's it say? Sin. Yeah. The Lord will never count against him. Never. Never. Now that's deep, right? Never. So that means David knew, David knew that God was never later going to say, David, don't forget Bathsheba. Sorry, mate, you're out. David knew that at the end, when he's standing there before God, God wouldn't say, David, because of Bathsheba, you're out. Instead, David knew God would never count this sin against him. All right, mate, come in. He knew God would never count this sin against him. Now, that's deep because in this room, there are a lot of secret sins, right? There's a lot of secret sins. Now, some of you are sweating now thinking, he's talking about me. I'm talking about everyone, right? We've all got secret stuff that when we have tea and coffee in a minute, we're not going to say, oh, by the way, yeah, 15 years ago, I did this. We're not going to do that because we want them to be secret, yeah? We want to push them down because we're like, boy, if people know that, they count it against me. Well, David knew that actually before God, that because God had forgiven him, that God would never count those sins against him. God would never bring them up. And we need to know that because if we're trusting in Jesus, there's times in our life where in our head pops one of them secret sins. And we're like, oh, oh, that sin. Oh, no, I'm not right with God. And at those times, we need to 
pull out our ID card, metaphorically speaking, and be like, I've got Christ's ID card. Christ's ID card says 100% righteous. I am 100% righteous. Even though I've done that terrible sin, I'm 100% righteous. Now, that also means that we can tell one another secret sins and, and say, you know what, I, I did this sin. I never told anyone. I just feel I've got to get off my chest and tell someone. And then we can say to our friends who come to us with that, say, did you ever ask God for forgiveness about that? And they say, yes. And we say, do you trust Jesus? And they say, yes. And then we say, well, mate, you've got Christ's ID card. God will look at you and regard you as 100% righteous. So you don't have to feel guilty about that sin. And furthermore, I ain't going to judge you for that sin. Because I know it's covered by Jesus' blood. So at New Life Church, right, we should be a community of people who like know that each one of us has got Jesus' ID card. Which means we're not going to judge one another. Which means we can say to one another, boy, I know you did that, but I forgive you. And I know you got Jesus' ID card, so you're righteous. So I won't count it against you. Furthermore, God's not going to count it against you. And I don't want to see you squirm with guilt because the Bible says God won't count that sin against you. So what I think God's saying to us today through his word in Romans 4 is use my son's ID. Use my son's ID. Don't feel that you've got to work hard enough to get right with God. You don't and you never can get right with God. Just use God's son's ID. And don't feel that you're right with God because you have been working hard for God. Because it doesn't work that way either. Just use God's ID. And for people who are feeling like, I'm just not good enough. None of us are good enough. Just use God's son's ID. ID, Jesus Christ. And for those of us who tend to sometimes look down on other people and think, well, we're better than them because we're good Christians, let's remember we're not good people. We're just people who've got God's Son's ID. This should change the way we live our lives. So we are as humble people who just trust in Jesus Christ and the salvation that he gives us instead of thinking that we're good people ourselves. So just take a minute of silence and just think about, are you right with God? And what are you trusting in to be right with God? I'll just pray. Lord God, none of us are right with you by things that we do. We are sinners and wicked people and we got secret sins and we got sins that people know about. We pray that you would forgive us of our sins. We pray that you would clothe us with Jesus's righteousness. We pray that you would give us Jesus's ID card that says 100% righteous. That's the only way we can be right in your presence. And we thank you for the wonderful gift that you give us, that if we believe in you by faith, we can be regarded by you as righteous. We thank you so much for that wonderful gift. We thank you that it's not something we got to work for, but that it's a gift. And I pray that you would help us today to accept the gift and to cling on to the gift and to not forget the gift. And I pray, God, you'd help us to be a church that don't look down on people, but a church that realizes we're all wicked people and we're all people in the church who've got this gift. And so we shouldn't count one another's sin. And thank you, God, that you don't count our sins if we have faith in Jesus Christ who died and rose again. Amen.